Well, I guess we'll get started. Um, it's Wednesday, September 13th, 2023, 6 p.m. Uh, we'll start with uh, the flag salute. Uh, Vice Chair Fla uh, Price, would you lead us in the flag salute? I will. All who are able, please stand and face the flag. Make the proper salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, first item, uh, Secretary. Roll call. Commissioner Flowers. Present. Commissioner Rinnick is absent this evening. Commissioner Schuler. Here. Commissioner Shimunenko is absent this evening. Commissioner Shishko. Here. Vice Chair Price. Here. Chair Van Duker. Here. Thank you. Uh, next item. Consent calendar approval of minutes for May 10th. Uh, yeah, I'd ask for a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from May 10th, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Next item. Public comment. Under Government Code 54954.3, members of the audience may address the commission on any agenda item within the jurisdiction of the commission or on any agenda item. Those wishing to speak on non-agenda items will be called upon at the beginning of the meeting. Those wishing to speak against or for an agenda item will be called upon after the presentation by the city planning department for that agenda item. Are there any uh, speakers for non-agenda items tonight? I have no speaker cards. Okay, uh, next item. Item 5A, Citrus Town Event Center, file number PLN 23-11, the applicant requests approval of use permit to allow conversion of 6,000 square feet of ex existing space into an event center located within Citrus Town Shopping Center at 7942 Arcadia. The project is exempt from CEQA. Project Planner Allison Bermudez. Good evening, Commission. Nice to see you. Allison representing the Planning Division in this item tonight. Um, as Stacy mentioned, this is a use permit request for an event center. Um, this is located on Arcadia Drive on the back side of Citrus Town Center. We're probably most familiar with this space from previous nightclubs and bars over the years since I was probably a teenager. It's been a variety of those things. Um, and so now it's been vacant for a number of years and our applicant um, would like to convert it into an event space. Uh, so similar use as the past, um, but this would be a rental, uh, rented for weddings, birthday parties, showers, things like that. Um, so it'll be not an open nightclub bar, but it'll be an event space. So just to re-familiarize yourself, um, it's on the backside of Citrus Town Center, faces Arcadia Drive. So Citrus Town Center itself faces uh, Greenback and Sunrise. This is really the only building on the back side that has an entrance on Arcadia. And across the street um, since um, in the past, what, year and a half or so, there's new homes there on Arcadia Drive. You see the rooftops of them there. Um, so those homes across the street are about 160 feet away, uh, which as we reviewed the project um, was a concern because it's always been vacant space. You remember years ago it was a golf course and things like that, so the use of the space wasn't a concern. Uh, but we have looked at it, analyzed it. It's over 160 feet away with this proposed operation, um, everything being inside the building um, and nothing outdoors on the rental space. You can see they have a very large patio, um, but that won't be used for any events. It would just be for people socializing. And with the hours of operation proposed, um, we did not believe it would be an impact to those neighbors. Um, in addition, when those homes were built, um, we knew the past history of this, spot, this space commonly was used uh, for a bar. Uh, so we did have the developer include in the, buy, uh, the purchase documents acknowledgement that those owners understood um, that there was a, they were a commercial shopping center. 
So the project is not, uh, is not requesting any major structural changes or modifications to the space. Everything being done for the event center has, is internal. Um, he's upgrading the inside, uh, improving um, how it looks and feels uh, so it can be used for nice events. Um, it will be available for rental seven days a week, and as mentioned, all events will be inside. Uh, the site does provide adequate parking. There are several parking spaces in close proximity to the rental space, as well as hours of operation for this are somewhat off center from the commercial space. So um, there's plenty of space throughout the center if need be, but on the back side there is well over 100 spaces, which should be plenty. The floor plan submitted, uh, gen most events are gonna use round tables and chairs, and with that layout, um, about 210 people would be able to occupy the space. Um, but we have set a limit of 400 persons um, for the facility, should he have an event that doesn't use tables and chairs, it would be limited to 400 uh, persons. That's the same capacity that we have placed on the other bars um, and other types of users that have been in that space. Uh, so in the conclusion, uh, the request is for a use permit to operate the event center at the 7942 Arcadia Drive. We well, reviewed it in compliance with the city's general plan, the zoning code, and other adopted policies. We found it to be um, in conformance with those and based upon the information uh, provided to you in the staff report and through the attachments and exhibits, um, we are recommending approval. I have the motions up on the screen. I the applicant is also here. Should you have any questions that I'm unable to answer? Do any of the commissioners have any questions for staff? I, I have one. Um, it, there was a use permit for the bars that were there before. Does that expire or something if they're not, if it's not used? Correct, they had been vacant for, we have a uh, one year. So if a use permit is not used for one year, then it would lapse. Okay. Any I do have a question. Is there any contingency put on the type of event that can be held there? There is not uh, currently anything in there except it has to be inside, um, but there is nothing beyond that that's a condition. Is there any zoning in that building or uh, that would prevent a um, concert venue or something like that um, if they so choose to have that type of event there? Currently, there's nothing prohibiting um, except for the noise limit that's mm -hmm. placed upon all users. So they would have to comply with any noise ordinance um, and the 400 person capacity. And then the other question I had is it was, um, I'm not, I, I know where it is because I remember the events that were there. I can't remember what's on the back side of that. It's just open area in the back. Okay, so it's a loading share a zone. Wall. Yeah, they don't share a wall with any of the users of Commercial Center. It's like that loading, I think the trash enclosures and stuff like that are behind. Okay. Um, and I, I, it's just, it's, I remember there used to be right in the breezeway between, uh, as we're looking at that photo there, just to the left of it, right in between there. I remember that one summer that I, or, or maybe even two summers, there were concerts out there. Um, and I don't know why that, they, they're not having those anymore if there was a, a noise oh or oh the Cit citrus town citrus center town center would oh yes they do do outdoor con i think they do it further that'd be to the east in between the two centers okay so that's still that's still happening yes that's not okay. part of this yeah and that's haven't had any problem with any any issues there okay no mm -mm. thank you that's all the questions i had I did want to compliment staff on, on thinking ahead and uh, putting the notification and the the buyers of those facilities homes across the street that this was this kind of opportunity might be there. So I do compliment staff on doing that. That was that was a good foresight. Um, I did speak with staff, uh, asked the question, although it was in the report. Um, I did ask the staff, its staff, about alcohol and uh, the contractors would be brought in that you know, th this would not be necessarily a, a bar, as it were, to have on-site alcohol all the time. Basically, they would bring in contractors to run those kind of facilities. Um, I think it's, you know, I think it's great. Uh, the other thing I guess I would say um, is that within, I believe it was the business plan, I was just trying to look, look for it again, um, and I realized maybe the business plan maybe preceded some of the, the conditions and whatever else, but it talked about the outdoor area 
uh, being there and available and to party and whatever. And I know uh, it has been talked about, and I presume that the applicant is clear that that is not necessarily for partying outside, it's for just socializing and whatever else. And uh, where it becomes, goes from socializing to partying, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but no, I think it's a great use. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Uh, would uh, I'll open the public uh, hearing. Would the applicant like to speak to the issue or anyone else? Not seeing anything, I'll close the public hearing. And can I have a motion? I'll a motion to adopt the resolution 23-05, determining that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA per section 15301, existing facilities of the California Environmental Quality Act. I'll second. So the uh, motion is made by Commissioner Sh Sheeler and seconded by Commissioner Price. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion passes. Approve a use permit to allow an existing 16,000 square foot tenant space located at seven, one, oh, geez, 7942 Arcadia Drive to be converted into an event center subject to the findings contained in this staff report and attached conditions of approval. Second. So the motion is made by Commissioner Sheeler and seconded by Commissioner Shisko. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, any determination by the Planning Commission may be appealed to the City Council by filing a written notice of appeal and the appropriate filing fees, $250, with the City Clerk not later than 10 calendar days after the date on which the determination is made. Uh, next item, please. Item 5B, Sylvan Corners. Sylvan Corner Subdivision File Number PLN22-28. The applicant requests approval of the required entitlements to develop a 94 lot for sale single family home subdivision on an 11.34 acre site located at 7137 Auburn Boulevard. A mitigated neg negative declaration for the project was prepared and published for public review as requested under CEQA project planner Allison Bermudez. Good evening, Commission. Uh, once again, I have a project for you tonight. First one was a warm-up. This would be a little bit bigger. All right, so um, uh, this is a Sylvan Corner subdivision project. I want to give you a view of the site that we're talking about. I think everyone is very familiar with Sylvan Corners, how affectionate kind of heart of our city, um, a very important piece, center to our city. Um, so it's developing uh, the site formerly known where Sylvan Middle School uh, previously was. Um, and so that is what we're talking about is this picture right here. All right, so what we have tonight is a subdivision on the 11.34 on the acre site, proposal to develop 94 single family uh, residential units, six open space lots, so 100 lots total, 94 being residential. Um, all the units single family, they're detached units, so they're single family standalone uh, product. They will be for sale units, so home ownership uh, units. So the mix of two housing types proposed, 70 units, um, what we call small lot. Uh, they're traditional style, uh, but they're on a smaller uh, lot. And then 24 lots on an alley loaded product. So if you recall the Mitchell Farms project where you had a single family home that had the alley in the back for entrance, this is a similar product. Uh, the traditional lots, they're gonna average about 3,000 to 5,000 square feet. Most of them be in the, uh, in the three to 4,000 square foot range. Um, and the alley loaded lots range from about 2,600 to 5,700 uh, with most of them in that two and 3,000 square foot range. A traditional mix of single family with single car garages and then some or single story with single car garages and the traditionals. And then there's also two story with uh, two car garages in the traditional style. And then all the alley loaded products are two story with two car garages. And a background on the site. Um, so this, this is the site of this former Sylvan Middle School. 
Um, Sylvan Middle School, the school district uh, closed down this school and relocated next door uh, to the site that adjoins this. It used to be an elementary school, so that was reformatted into the middle school. And then uh, this site was very old. The buildings were some of the original buildings in the district um, were eventually uh, demolished. Uh, the school district did not have a need for the property anymore, so they did put it up for sale. The city was very interested in the, in the site um, and ended up purchasing it from San Juan Unified School District. Um, and the purpose of the purchase really was, um, you know, as I talked earlier, this is really the heart of the city. Everyone's affectionately knows Sylvan Corners has referenced its longstanding name in the community. Um, it's the intersection of some major roads for us. So we really cared about what happened on this site. Uh, we wanted to have some control over its future what it's gonna look like. The city had invested already millions of dollars in improving Auburn Boulevard um, and the corners, and we wanted to have really some vision and some control of what would happen at this site. So that's the reason the city purchased it, is so we could be involved in the process. Did not purchase it with the intent of being the developer, um, which we're not tonight, we're not the developer, we're just the landowner, um, but we did want to have be involved in who would be doing that developing. Uh, so after the purchase, the city did um, develop some goals that we'll talk about of how we wanted to see the site develop. And um, we'll get into that part of how the project is meeting those goals. Uh, but to get to that point, we needed to offer the site to the community, to the development community, and see what was out there. Um, and so we did put out an offering mem memorandum, uh, released it for public um, to all the development community, and ultimately um, have selected Woodside Homes, who's the applicant tonight for the project, to um, with their proposal that they submitted. And so we've been working with them for well over a year now on this and to present to you this project tonight. Um, and so they are the applicant and the city is the property owner. Several entitlements um, are required to get this project complete. Uh, we have a general plan amendment that's amending the land use for the property from public to medium density residential. We're rezoning the property from the residential zone RD2 to a special planning area. There's a zoning text amendment to create the Sylvan Corners um, special planning area. A subdivision map that will actually create those 100 lots. A design review permit for the review of the exterior elevations of the homes and the site layout for the site. And then a tree permit for the removal of trees. So first of all, we'll talk about the general plan amendment. As you recall, the general plan identifies land uses throughout the city in kind of broad terms. You're gonna have areas that are uh, have a land use for commercial, areas that have a land use of residential under varying densities. Uh, you can have a business professional zone. Uh, so there's kind of a broad uh, brush of zoning or land use allowances in the city. Um, and the, so the general plan uh, land use for this particular property um, currently is public, uh, which is the appropriate land use for the school. Uh, public land use uh, allows for schools and post offices and things like that of public facilities. Uh, so that was appropriate when it was a school, but as a residential development is no longer the appropriate land use. So the proposal is changing it uh, from the uh, public to what we call medium density residential, uh, referred to as MDR. Um, that allows a density range, covers several zoning classifications with a density ranging from nine to 20 units per acre. Uh, this project uh, is 14 dwelling units per acre, so it qualifies as a medium density project. And so the proposal is to change the land use designation from public to MDR. In addition, on top of the land use, there's also a zoning classification, and that's the more specific uh, designation that's placed on property uh, that will identify what uses can go on the site, um, what type of buildings, how they're used, their size, those are all regulated by zoning. Uh, so the zoning, the um, land use is medium density residential, as I mentioned, covers a wide range of residential densities. Um, this site, was an RD2 zone, which is a very low dense residential zone. Uh, the two designates the density. Uh, so RD2 means you're gonna find about two units per acre. Uh, so it's very low density. 
school operated in the RD2 zone as schools are allowed in any residential zone. So that's why it had that low uh, density zoning designation. Uh, so with the creation of this development, uh, since we're at 14 units per acre, um, the RD2 is no longer appropriate. And so in the design of this project, we're, we're having small lots, we're having public streets, we're having alleys, uh, we're having narrower lots than standard residential zoning. Uh, so then uh, we have placed it into what we call this special planning area or an SPA. And so the zoning request is to change it from RD2 to an SPA zone, uh, which will be known as Sylvan Corners. And SP, SPA zones, um, they really are, they take the zoning code and its development standards, but even get a little bit more detailed and let it, they let it adjust so it's not the same development standards as you would find um, in other zones. So if it was just a straight RD development standard, you'd have very specific development standards. The, the special planning area allows us to deviate from that a little bit and to really accommodate the site to make the best use of the site. Uh, so SPAs, we have other ones in the city. Uh, Mitchell Farms was developed as an SPA because it had a lot of unique features that we needed to accommodate. Uh, the Mariposa project, the new homes, the 46 new homes on the south side of Mariposa uh, towards Madison, that's an SPA. And the Greenback Woods development is also an SPA um, because it has a lot of unique features. Uh, so it was appropriate to define this product and this project as an SPA so we could accommodate um, the alleys, the public streets, the private streets, and the narrow lots. So a project specifically, um, as mentioned, these are a for sale product. Uh, so they will be developed by Woodside Homes, built and sold by Woodhide, Woodside Homes for home ownership. Um, 14 of the units of the 94 will be set aside and sold to, in, to families or persons uh, that meet the lower income qualifications. The development will be managed by an HOA, a homeowners association, um, who will uh, maintain the front yards. They'll maintain the detention basin that we'll speak about, uh, the entry features into the site, uh, the little passive park. There's some theme fencing throughout the project. All that will be um, maintained in, by the homeowners association. So it really does help keep the development looking nice attractive and consistent appearance. The choices that the developers came, there's four different exterior elevation styles with varying colors and materials. So there'll be 18 different design choices. Um, so the development is also set up where you won't have the same type of design side by side. They'll be scattered throughout the development to give it a nice variety. Uh, so you have a nice visual street view. Um, when you're going down the street, you're not gonna see you know, cookie cutter type house along the way. You're gonna have varying styles. As I said, there was also a mix of single story um, in with the two story. The homes themselves are all electric with any star energy star appliances, so very energy efficient. Some of the amenities of the project, there are six open space lots, um, including the entry features, the site, as I show you, will have two entrances um, from the east side of the Auburn Boulevard side. Um, and those uh, open space lots are serving two purposes. They really provide a gateway into the development and provide some landmarking uh, for the development and show, really give a massive grand entrance. And they're also preserving some of those beautiful oak trees that are out there. So they're incorporated into those open space lots. There'll be a small passive park. So if you go into the southern entrance into the development, as you pull in, you're gonna see open space lots you know, at Auburn Boulevard and looking straight ahead, uh, you'll have visual into this little passive park. They'll have some really cool little features, allow the community to gather and picnic um, and a little passive play um, area for kids to gather. So uh, and that will be a visual right as you come into the development. Um, the detention basin is along the south side of the project along um, Auburn Boulevard. Um, it's a required development amenity uh, to handle water quality, water runoff. Uh, they've done a great job at designing that detention basin and really making it a feature for the development. Um, it's gonna have a variety of plants, shrubs, uh, to give that visual interest. It'll have fencing around it and then 
along the basin also will be the walking trails that will connect throughout the development. Uh, the will also be able to connect from the development into the Sylvan Middle School, the new Sylvan Middle School that's next door. So that will allow um, any students living in the development to access the school property during school hours without having to walk out and uh, out along Auburn Boulevard. Um, and also have a connection from the walking pass from the development to the Sylvan Plaza. And that's the plaza that's at the intersection, the curb there of Auburn and Auburn and um, Sylvan, uh, where we have the big cylinder uh, markings and the kind of the historical line landmark. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, walk the, the walking trails along the retention basin along the south side of the property and out into that plaza area. Uh, the visual on the top kind of shows how the site would lay out. As you see, the alley ones and twos and threes and fours, those are the private alleys. Those are maintained by the HOA, and that provides that back entrance into those houses that face Auburn Boulevard. And then the streets are the public streets, and those would be the publicly maintained streets. Uh, the blue dashed lines that you see throughout the site are the connected paths. So it's a way for pedestrians can walk from Auburn Boulevard um, into the streets and access the development. As you see, they come in, if you look at Street E, the one on, it's technically the south, but it's on the right side of this photo. Um, you can enter from Auburn Boulevard along that open space, that green open lot area across the street, and then walk along the other trails, uh, pathways that would get you over to the detention basin there on the right shows the, the trail extends around uh, the perimeter of the basin, connects to the plaza, and then the arrows that show that connects where the school gate would be. And then the passive park uh, shown there with that number four, as you can see where that is on the site. So if you're entering the development um, from Auburn Boulevard at Street E and looking straight ahead, so you have very large trees and landscaping and features at the entrance, uh, but your vision to straight ahead is this passive park with the, some trees that are being preserved as well. Okay. On the bottom is kind of a typical streetscape that you might see um, from the internal streets, showing the, the mix of houses, the variety of houses um, that could be side by side and showing that no two are just alike. There's a visual from Auburn Boulevard. So this is the homes that face Auburn Boulevard. It was very important um, that this development did not basically turn its back on Auburn Boulevard. We didn't want a sound wall along Auburn. We wanted visual, we wanted to activate that area. Um, and we, don't wanted, we didn't want a sound wall and just rooftops being the visual from the street. Uh, so the homes do face Auburn Boulevard, they have a uh, front yard, landscaping, there's some theme fencing as you see here with plantings, uh, the separated sidewalk that exists, um, but this would be a visual, and then the median on, on Auburn, the visual looking from across Auburn uh, to those streets that face, or to those homes that face Auburn Boulevard. The detention basin is mentioned, it's on the south side of the property. Um, it's a needed amenity for the development to capture water runoff. Uh, it does serve as a detention basin during storm events to hold water, filter it out before it enters the storm drain system. And so the plants um, and the brush, I mean the grasses and stuff there inside are very important to filtering out the pollutants that are in the water before it does go into the storm drain system. Uh, but as you can see, it's been designed with trees, shrubs, grasses, uh, to really give a good visual from Auburn Boulevard. So not only for the people that are walking inside and around using the trail around it, but if you're driving down Auburn Boulevard, really want to make sure that this did not look like, um, you know, a dry basin with dead grasses, as they do just because of the hot summer. Sometimes you'll see that. Uh, but careful attention has been uh, paid to the types of plantings that are in here to avoid that appearance. We really wanted to preserve the visual from Auburn Boulevard for people walking along the street or driving by, uh, that they have a nice presence as they look into the detention basin area. 
And as mentioned, I just want to touch on the affordable housing component. Uh, there's 14 units in this in the 94 that will be reserved for lower income. And the, this is happening uh, for a couple reasons. It's important to provide affordable housing for our community, give people um, of more restricted incomes opportunities for home ownership so they would live and stay in our community. Uh, but because the city owns this land and because we're selling it, it qualifies as what uh, is identified as surplus land. So the city owns it. We no longer need it. When we, when a governmental agency owns property and they go to sell it, it's restricted of, on its outcome. Uh, so with m recent legislation over the past few years, um, government sold property. If it's developed for housing, it does come with an affordable housing requirement. Uh, so we are meeting our state required guidelines by providing by requiring 15% of the units be set aside for affordable. So if there's 94 units being built, 15% um, have to be reserved for lower income because this is a for sale product. Um, so that's 14 units, that's where the 14 came from. And then so there's a covenant placed on those 14 lots where they have to stay in the affordable program for 45 years. Um, I, the staff report mentioned 45 years and maybe one other spot it said 55 years. So I just wanted to clarify, uh, it is 45 years um, since this is a for sale product. Uh, so what happens with the affordable units is the city and the developer into an affordable housing agreement uh, that restrict that and talk, walk them. We have affordable housing guidelines, so the developer has to follow those. We partner with them, work with them on uh, reaching out for buyers, having programs to help them learn how to qualify, how to become a homeowner, and then make sure that they're educated on their responsibility, not only of home ownership, but, o but owning an affordable restricted unit. Uh, because if they sell it you know, in less than 45 years, they have to resell it to another qualified buyer. So we spend a lot of time with those buyers just to un so they understand um, the restrictions that they might have owning a unit. But it is a great opportunity uh, for them as the homes are sold at a reduced cost so they can qualify. Uh, the, and then the city and the buyer also work, um, enter into an agreement for that affordable housing unit. The project went through extensive environmental re review as required. Um, we did an initial study, which does an assessment of all the potential impacts. And through that study, it was determined that there could be possible environmental impacts. Uh, but those impacts that were possible could be mitigated to what they call a less than significant amount through specific mitigation measures. Uh, so that then qualified the project to process what's called a mitigated negative declaration or an MND. Uh, so that was prepared in accordance with CEQA. The MND was circulated for public review and comment for the required 30 days. Uh, that gets sent out to many agencies, governmental agencies, and for the public. Um, it's posted on the website and shared the number of measures for people to review and comment. Uh, we collect those comments, respond to anything uh, that's necessary. Um, and so we received, I believe, four comments from a, a variety of uh, governmental agencies, and those responses are included in the final MD that was in your packet. One of the mitigation measures, the mitigation measures um, that the MD had, most of them are pretty standard. They talk about, um, you know, when you're grading and digging um, and you find remains or, you know, how the traffic is going to be handled for construction. Um, how dust is handled during construction. So those are all pretty common mitigation measures. Uh, but one that did come out um, was through traffic review. Uh, we wanted, we had a traffic analysis prepared um, for the site to see if it's developed, you know, what, how will it traffic be impacted. Uh, so through that assessment that was presented to you, um, some minor changes will be done. And so we'll cover those quickly and also have our engineering staff here who are really the experts on traffic, should you have a question that above my expertise. <laughs> um, so the project will have two entrances, one on the north side and one on the south side. Um, they will be right ins and right outs, only out of the subdivision. You will not be able to go left. Uh, so 
thinking that there are people that would probably live here that would want to travel north on Auburn Boulevard. Um, so uh, uh, the traffic has decided that you will be able to exit, go right. You have time to get over into a lane and go to the Auburn, old Auburn, Auburn intersection and where U-turns are allowed. So if you lived in the development and you want to travel north on Auburn Boulevard, uh, you would exit the site to the right and you would go to the intersection and make the appropriate U-turn and travel north. As commonly happens, people might look for a shortcut. And so um, being that there is open, there's the center lane down Auburn Boulevard that's kind of an open free turn lane that's used uh, for people traveling in and out of that, what well, Sylvan Corners Plaza, which is the commercial center across the street. Um, it's an open area for ins and outs of that. They could leave the development, go into that center lane and make a U-turn, an illegal U-turn. It's posted no U-turns. Um, so that is something we need to monitor um, and it's a condition and a mitigation measure um, that we will see how residents adjust uh, if they're going to the traffic light and following the traditional traffic laws and making the U-turn be no issues. But should, develop, for should we see an increase in illegal U-turns, um, the traffic department will work with the developer and make some adjustments through additional signage um, as necessary to um, restrict that so that doesn't happen. Um, in addition, there'll be some new striped bicycle lanes um, on Auburn Boulevard, as shown in the green, uh, that will give better protection for bicyclists. And then the medians, or the proper terms, I'm gonna call them push button, but <laughs> the signal operations uh, will be adjusted for to protect the people turning right, so if you recall, so you travel south on Auburn Boulevard, you get to that pork chop area where you have kind of like a free right to continue on Auburn Boulevard and go in front of the new Sylvan Middle School. There's no traffic control there, there's a crosswalk, but there's nothing to stop you from proceeding should there be a student there. Uh, so that will be re-timed, if that's the correct term. Um, so. Um, if the button's pushed, our students there, it will stop that traffic from free-flowing right uh, so the students can cross safely. Did I hit them all? Oh, and the phasing change of the signals will be updated also to accommodate the additional development. Uh, the traffic study did, did determine that there's the level of service for the area is not being decreased with this development uh, to cause any other changes to the traffic flow um, besides what I mentioned. Uh, this is just a picture of that center median that I was talking about. Uh, so the vacant property there on the left side of the screen. Um, and then you see that open area um, across from that Sylvan Corner shopping center that we're talking about, where people could exit that development, scoot across the lanes and get into that turn lane and make an illegal U-turn, even though there's a sign there that says no U-turn. Um, and I also mentioned that uh, when the city purchased the property and before we did the offering mem memorandum out to the public, <coughs> we really wanted to be clear and concise of what type of product or what we were looking for. Um, and so the city council um, adopted some goals uh, that were included in that offering memorandum. So when a development, a developer submitted their proposal to us, they would be very clear, um, you know, their, this is what their project is gonna be used to see if it meets. Uh, we didn't want just to open, here some property for sale, give us what you want there. We wanted to be very clear what we were looking for. Uh, so some of the adopted goals that are applicable to this project, and, and just so you know, when we put the offering memorandum out, we didn't know what it was gonna be. It could be housing, it could have been commercial center, it could have been a variety of things. Uh, we weren't set on any one topic. Um, just so happened that, let's say COVID came, commercial development is not really what's needed any longer. It wasn't really what was attractive for that corner because we still had Stock Ranch uh, right down the street that had a lot of commercial space still to develop. So we didn't want to detract from the opportunities at Stock Ranch. 
Um, but we did have some clear defined goals of how we want this property to look and feel for the community. So the land use goals that the city council adopted, including you know, to consider the property's adjacency. You have a cemetery on one side and you have a school on the other. So what develops there, you need to consider the adjacency. Uh, this, product, this project has done that uh, through that connection and providing the students a safe way to access the school without having to traverse to Auburn Boulevard. Um, if it's housing, um, you know, if it consists of for sale units, we want it designed for specific needs, uh, workforce housing that's close to a school, maybe it's teacher housing. So there's a variety of options like that um, that were available. I believe this project does that. It has a variety of three bedroom and four bedroom options. It has some smaller lots. Um, it has some larger homes. And then you have the affordable component. So it is also meeting that goal. The concept goal that the council adopted really was to enhance those pedestrian connections. So not only one to the school, but to the nearby businesses. How could any development at this site promote the you know nearby coffee shop or other businesses that are in the area and the work that we're doing to improve Auburn Boulevard? How can it connect to Sylvan Plaza and uh, you know introduce that public space into more activity? It's a beautiful space. Um, but how can we incorporate that into the development? Uh, so this project has done that too with those pedestrian connections. And really the design goals really is to provide well-designed parking areas that are screened from Auburn Boulevard and the plaza, uh, which by fronting those houses on Auburn Boulevard, keeping the parking in the back, there's no garages facing Auburn Boulevard. Um, it's meeting those design goals. Um, as mentioned, it is incorporating the plaza into the design and it's activating Auburn Boulevard with those frontages um, facing Auburn Boulevard. As usual, we always compare our projects to our general plan and to the vision that was set out in the general plan. Um, and it is meeting several goals of the plan, including goal four uh, that talks about compatibility with the neighborhood um, and policy 4.5, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then goal 24 really is increasing home ownership, home ownership opportunities. That's been a vision of the city since its incorporation in 1997, is what can we do to increase home ownership opportunities? We were a pretty built out city, not a lot of vacant land. We don't have opportunity for brand new homes very often. Uh, just recently with the Mitchell Farms, you know, the biggest one we've had, uh, that's really since one of the few brand new projects we've had that's offered a number of housing units. Uh, so this is adding to those options. And then uh, provide sites for housing opportunities to serve all types of residents. Uh, so this is doing that with a variety of housing choices. And then again, you know, the design, the style of housing, um, it's, it's meeting that goal as well. General plan policy 4.5 is important uh, for us when we're reviewing the uh, projects that have rezonings. Uh, so this part of our general plan is something we talk about with every applicant who considers to rezone property is you need to read general plan policy 4.5 and understand the standards that we have in place. So if you're considering to rezone a property, you need to be able to meet this goal. And it really says that rezones to increase density. So if you have a property that is zoned one density and you want to increase that to get more units, um, we're only going to allow that for projects that provide superior design and they have an enhanced community benefit. So we're not going to allow you to rezone your property from five units to acre to 10 units per acre just so you can get more houses. You need to demonstrate to us how those increased units are providing a community benefit. And it can be done through a number of ways. This particular project is doing that. It's providing some pedestrian connections, which we don't have. Uh, to the school from the development. Um, it's providing homes that are using a variety of materials. So you have four models available, but in total you have 18 different design choices. Uh, the, the layout, taking advantage of that public plaza, the Sylvan Plaza that we have there through those connected pathways. Uh, the walking paths around the detention basin are a, a making a design requirement into a nice feature of the development. Um, and then the project is providing your energy efficient homes through their all electric 
um, and their high their energy star appliances. This project had a lot of public outreach, um, even going back to the application we received for this project. When the city purchased the site, and prior to us putting the site on the open market for sale, we were very conscious about the nearby residents. We wanted them to be aware. We, ha we have bought this property, and we are selling it, uh, and it, it will be developed in the future, but we wanted to let them know that we're working on a variety of goals. We asked their for, their for their participation in providing comments on the goals that we adopted. And so we really did a robust public outreach, outreach even before we had an application received. And then once we did receive an application uh, for this development, the developer um, held two community meetings, uh, one in January of this year and then a second one in August. The first one in January was really soon after the application was received. The city had not completed any type of review, uh, finished its review of the initial application, but they really wanted to get public input and hear concerns uh, from the public early on, so they did that. And then in August, they held a second one so they could reshare um, how the project had changed or developed over time and uh, presented that to the community. In addition, we did our standard um, public outreach noticing through, you know, the sign's been posted on this vacant site for probably a year or so now, uh, that there was a pending application, provided people a link to learn more about it. Um, we've had it on the website, the newspaper, and all the traditional um, standard notifications that we do. And up to this point, um, we've re I've received no public comments um, input from anyone, you know, besides who's attended the public meetings and their comments were incorporated into the project. Um, but tonight I have nothing further on public comments for you to share, no way for me to share. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the project application for Woodside Homes to develop the Sylvan property into 94 single family homes has been reviewed for compliance with the city's general plan the zoning code and other adopted goals and policies, and through uh, with your acceptance or to change the general plan and the zoning to meet the development, um, we found that it be to be consistent. And the information that presented to you in the staff report and the provided attachments, uh, we believe it's appropriate findings can be made to approve the project. One thing I did fail to mention <laughs> um, is that your actions tonight are, are only a recommendation uh, because there is a rezone and a general plan land use change, those are policy actions that the city council has to make. Uh, so we keep the package, the development package all together. Uh, so you're not deciding on, on the design stuff and they're deciding on the zoning. We keep it all together. So all of uh, your decision tonight will go to the city council in October. I'll present to them your actions and your recommendation to them and they'll take final action. I have the motions um, when we get to that point. Um, I do have a presentation from the developer who's here tonight who will walk you through some additional points and amenities of the site. They do a much better job at that than I do. Uh, so I will, when you're ready, you can open up the hearing, the applicant's here, and I'll pull up the presentation. Okay, <coughs> I'll go ahead and open the uh, public hearing, have the applicant uh, do the presentation. And I'm going to beg to differ. That was an excellent presentation. I almost thought maybe I could just not do it because you did so comprehensive. Uh, Woodside's extremely appreciative of the relationship we have with uh, city and, and staff. Uh, we've been very impressed and enjoy our working relationship with them. Um, they're very comprehensive, really looking out and making and pushing Woodside to make sure we have and deliver a great community to the city. We all have shared goals. We want a great community, the city deserves, and the city wants a great community. So those are why it's so important, our vision and our goals are in line. Uh, do you have the ability to click or do I up here? So wanted to, one, I want to respect everyone's time, and Allison did such a great job, she kind of covered 
about 96% of what we're going to present. But I thought it would be good just to get, I'm a visual person. I really like to see. So we have a lot more pictures up here. So we'll kind of go the first slides we'll have out here. This is a presentation that we used about three weeks ago for our second public outreach. We thought it was really important to make sure that all the residents have opportunity to kind of be involved at the beginning and also towards the end before we come to the Planning Commission. So this presentation was shared with some modifications based on what we heard from that presentation and, and from the citizens that were in attendance. So I'll go quickly. So Allison did a great job outlining. We designed this project to really come into what we were, uh, when we were doing the RFP and responding to that, what is the land use goals and design goals? And as Allison said, we did not want, we don't like it communities when you drive and you see a sound wall all the way down the street. Uh, okay, that's great somewhere, but how can we bring the community into the city? Um, so we agreed on the requirement that all of the alley loads facing Auburn on that main street will be, uh, it'll be an alley loads to the parking lot in back. It will bring the community and Auburn Boulevard and the rest of the community together. Uh, next slide, please. So as you already saw, this is the concept that we have up here. Um, it's 94 lots. Uh, we really wanted to make sure we were in the connect it with our surroundings. Make sure that we are compatible with the school. Make sure we're compatible with the cemetery on the side. There's also residents on our far corner that we have to make sure that we're compatible with. But how do we also open up and engage in Sylvan Corners Plaza? How do we engage with the school district? And we, we, Allison mentioned, we've worked with the school district. There's gonna be a gate that will have control locks by the school district. Um, that will allow kids to come through, make it a safer path path to travel, but it's also going to allow that there's some opportunity to educational experiences in the detention basin. Yeah, detention basins most people think are boring, but there's also learning opportunities there. And so we're going to have our HOA work with the school district to come up with learning opportunities, and that's why we can have that gate to go back and forth. And this was an important element that the school district approached us, and we thought it was a great idea. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to go quick. Please stop me at any time. Um, this is the what we really wanted to show is how is that interaction, how is that interplay between a busy street and housing. And so here you'll see there's about 22 to 26 feet. And I have my engineer, engineer, he can kick me if I said the wrong numbers. From Auburn Boulevard, you have a landscape corridor, then you have a sidewalk, then you have more landscape, then you have a decorative fencing, kind of like what is, um, just think of a little small fencing to kind of separate and give that homeowner a sense of, okay, this is where my area begins. Then you'll have about one to two steps up and then the house. So that because of the grading, you will have that elevated feel. It's not going to be right fl uh, flat um, at grade with the street. So we think that gives it a nice streetscape feel to it. Uh, next slide, please. So we, what has been really good about this application is not normal for home builders, is having all the architecture done before you get city approval, um, which is helpful in this event because we can now share our vision. It's a lot easier um, to show, okay, this is actual architects. We use BSB design. They do our architecture. Um, we've submitted the plans. This will be part of also when we submit floor plans and everything else, but we feel we have a good cross variety of housing st styles. We have the alley loads, and then we have our traditional two-story, single story. Um, next slide, please. So when you look at this, it's kind of the transportation network that Allison did a good job explaining and lists all the mitigations, but I also wanted to reconfirm, when you see the, uh, the HOA will be maintaining the private alley streets. That's uh, one of the things we worked with um, the city. That will be, uh, but the other streets for the traditional houses will be public. The HOA will also be maintaining all the decorative theme fence around all open space maintaining the detention basin, maintaining the small paths of recreation park, the entry features, and all the landscaping throughout the community. Um, we have a, that also allows for enforcement rights. One of the key things with HOAs is they have the ability to enforce that residents are maintaining. Or main, the HOA will be maintaining the front yards, but what if they don't do something right? Then there's an enforcement. They can enforce parking, they can enforce uh, there's been a common concern about gates entering on school property. Well, the HOA has enforcement rights, and they can go and actually lean the property and, and rem the, uh, fix the situation. So 
we think we tried to cover it, and that was those were important things we heard from the city, and we wanted to make sure that we expressed that we listened and that we've incorporated into our plans. Next slide, please. A lot of questions on parking. We actually have designed this to allow parking in the alley streets. That's not typical due to usually much smaller width, but we do have the ability for parking within the alley streets. Um, we're offering 196 parking stalls. There's parking in garage, there's parking on driveways, and there's public parking throughout the streets. Um, a lot of the red is because of it, we're restricting you know, going across the driveway and so forth. Next slide, please. I'm going quick, so we're here to answer questions. Landscaping, we really wanted to make sure, it's an 11-acre site, there's not a lot really you can do. So we worked really hard with uh, staff to really pull out what amenities we can provide and make sure. Um, so you'll see we'll have very good entry features along uh, Street A and the other street, the two entry points. The item number four was brought up as a small park. I'll show you some uh, schematic ideals of what we could do and program that area. And then the tension basin has probably been the air biggest area of work. How do we make that not be your typical dry basin that you see everywhere else in the region? Next slide, please. This is just showing that we've thought about where all the fencing is going to be, what types of fencing. We thought we had show where all the, what trees will be removed, what trees will remain. Along Street A, we heard a lot of um, desire to maintain the existing oaks that are there. So we actually changed our plan. We took a lot out to ensure that we can maintain that tree. Um, so we think that's an important element. Next slide, please. So these are concepts of monumentation and theming that we could do to really enhance and embrace the history of the site. Not to say this is exactly how it's going to look, but it's coming up with what we feel is some of the key elements that we could program in this community. Next slide, please. Still examples of gateways, signatures, all have to go through an approval by the city before we uh, will go and build the construction. Next slide, please. We've already also looked at landscaping and come up with typical landscapes for the alleys and traditional. So we've put that thought process in how we can make sure that it's an appealing from external from the site and internal within the site. Next. So this is just what we've talked about. We've kind of just really shown that we've looked at a lot and the staff has really made us think about how we're gonna do our entry features, how we're gonna do our landscaping. Everything that's a private open space for us our own open space by the HOA, we thought about how we're going to make sure it's interactive with the community, how we do in the landscape design. Next slide, please. So one of the key things is the basin in kind of the entry field and how that's gonna feel. Uh, as Allison mentioned, the basin has to work as a detention facility. It, it just has to meet its engineering requirements. So how do you make that attractive? How do you make that kind of a passive recreational use? knowing that you still have at the depths anywhere from four to six feet deep. So it can't be somewhere where you're gonna run through and play in either. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll kind of go back to the neighborhood park. These are just some concept plans that we came in. This is not somewhere that you're gonna have swing sets and ball fields, et cetera, but it's be a very nice uh, passive field to be able to go, uh, you know, sit, enjoy, read a book, or have your young children play at, um, so we're looking at various um, planning elements that will continue to evolve with staff as we come through with improvement plans. Well, then we'll be, this is the exact programming for this site, and so we're still working on that. Next slide, please. So this is kind of more the detention basin as we get to. I think everyone knows the, the need for it, but how can we make it aesthetically appealing? Next slide, please. So what we did is we took a full 360 view around it. Uh, Allison showed you one of the viewpoints. This is what you will feel if you are living in the community and you are living in those homes that are facing or backing up to the detention basin. So you take a walk around the community, you wanna go walk around the basin. This is how we feel that is that nice opening feel, various levels and degrees of landscaping, making it feel multiple dimensions, all drought tolerant planting, all has to, you know, that's, that's it's gonna be very hot during the summer, we have to make sure that it stays its uh, quality. And what the key emphasis we're saying is the HOA has to maintain this. And that there's funding in place to maintain it. That's the key. Next slide, please. So we wanted to show you how we looked at if you're gonna walk around Sylvan Plaza, how do we integrate? Really showing how it's not gonna stand out as an eyesore, this development. It's actually 
plays very nicely as it becomes more developed into um, the surrounding community. Next slide, please. And then this is the two, you saw the one on the right. The other one is more of a from the street. So we, we kind of came around with all concepts to show that we did look at it. And so if you had concerns about what is it gonna look like from the street corner within the site, outside the site. Next slide, please. And that's just the timing of what we've done. Uh, that was very quick. Obviously, myself and my team will be here for a lot of questions, uh, you know, as Allison directs. But I wanted to share what we've been showing the community, what we've been sharing and working with staff. Woodside's very excited, very committed to this project. Um, our goal, assuming all the entitlements come on, is getting improvement plans submitted, grading plans submitted, and I really am well, hoping to start grading next one. So, you know, that's our commitment. That's the timeline that we're working internally. I will defer to Allison. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right, thanks, Commission, uh, for allowing us the opportunity to go through that um, information. It's, it's an important project, a lot of amenities, a lot of elements to it. Um, so hopefully between those two presentations, we got a good understanding. Uh, so I defer back to you for any questions you have of me and then um, I'll let, allow you to open up the public hearing. Do any commissioners have any uh, questions for staff? Yes, I have a couple of questions, and I guess I should have spoken up when the gentleman was making the presentation, because I, I have had these questions, or I pose these questions to staff, um, and as you said, Allison, does it, Allison and Casey do a great job, uh, and, the, and, the, and the traffic engineering department does a great job, too. Um, the units facing, I just thought, frankly, I'd bring them up because there may be interest from the public or thoughts from the public. Um, the units facing Auburn Boulevard obviously will be subject to more noise relative to that traffic. And the report talks about how utilizing, however the terminology was, particular construction technology uh, to try to mitigate that, that noise for, for those units. Can you expand on that at all? You know, we will design the community to meet the uh, city's requirements for it. I think it's at 60 decibels for a residential community, but don't quote me on that. So how do we mitigate that? And we do it in all of our communities. Uh, appropriate thickness of glass, appropriate insulation in the building materials. Um, so yes, we will be able to design We're all within Title 24, all the requirements. We will be designing a home to meet the noise requirements okay. on that. Solar on the on the buildings, um, how how are those maintained? Is that is that obviously the, the whoever purchases the property will will need to maintain that um, keep it comes, operational. Comes in a couple of, and, um, I'm going to butcher the operational side of the company, but um, so we have a solar package. We have uh, in our other communities, you have the ability to buy or lease. Depends on what program yeah. you select with SunPower or Sonova, who are there are solar panels solar providers uh, and comes, you know, depending which packet battery storage or not. So okay. each home will have that. We as a company, we are owned um, by Sakasui House in Japan, which we're being mandated to be net energy zero, net zero energy. So we meet most and exceed most California requirements and that's something Woodside takes pride in. We, as we get closer and we did input and distribute our master plans and we will have all of that detailed for city staff to uh, review, approve, and more importantly, enforce. Okay. So. Um, I don't know, I think that was frankly just uh, as staff can tell you, I had a number of questions for them. Some of the questions uh, showed my, my lack of understanding exactly about traffic. Um, HOA costs, I understand that maybe is maybe not nailed down to the dollar yet, uh, but obviously, but I, as I expressed to staff, uh, that'll be critically important for, for the lower income um, home, home buyers, so. I was yeah, and that's been a significant issue uh, discussed and worked with uh, staff. Uh, we, HOA is, is going to be expensive. There's a lot of amenities yeah. being maintained especially with the level of landscaping and so forth. Our current um, budgets, we have not going to submit, we have not submitted any DRE budget requests, but we, we have the same consultants that prepare all of our DRE work throughout the region. Um, we're in about, don't quote me exactly, because but I always hate giving out numbers, 
but it's anywhere from between 160 and 165. So it's getting up there. Okay. It is a concern. Okay. All right. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Yeah. Thank Don't you. quote me on that number, though. I have a question about the detention basin. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a question for you. Um, uh, you mentioned that, uh, by the way, the detention basin looks beautiful. What you guys did there looks good. Can you comment on the need for the detention basin? Uh, explain why it's needed versus, let's say, doing a park um, in that area. Okay. I'm we'll going to defer to. Uh, we'll have um, our drainage engineer oh, perfect. Um, come up and address that. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, Daniel Kerr, Engineer in General Services Department. Um, so when we look at any form of development within um, Sacramento County, we follow the county standards. We need to do two things, and uh, this basin's actually achieving both of those. So number one, we do need to make sure that the water, um, now that the site is no longer gonna be fallow or it's gonna have you know all these buildings and streets and hardscape, water runs off that much more quickly and has a potential to inundate our streams and existing drainage systems within the city. So that's why we call this the detention basin. Um, so we do need to detain that additional peak flow that's gonna happen when the property gets developed. And then the second condition that this detention basin is also meeting is that water quality element. So we also have a statewide, or actually federal government wide, but in particular we follow the state general construction permit for water quality. So uh, we as municipalities have a permit to ensure that all of the water leaving our storm drains and entering our creeks and therefore becoming waters of the state are clean and uh, free of trash and debris, which is actually a new requirement since 2016. This basin also achieves that through um, infiltrating through special percolating soil, uh, entering into pipes with holes in them essentially that um, slowly leach into our drainage facilities on Auburn Boulevard. I had a question as well. Um, is there any determination at this point which of the, um, uh, which of the, um, excuse me, 94 units will be um, the 14 affordable ones? Will they be located so throughout the project? A lot of it's gonna be market be driven. A lot of it will be market driven on based on the timing and the qualifications of each protect, uh, potential uh, buyer of those deed restricted homes. What our commitment in, in our to be a negotiated affordable housing plan is that it'll, the units will be inter intermixed and dispersed appropriately throughout the document so it won't be clustering or all put in a certain uh, location and so forth. And the ability to have intermix a uh, product type. Beautiful project, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's, I'm really impressed with Woodside. I've not seen a development from them yet, and I, I, I really, um, I think it's just comprehensive and thorough and absolutely beautiful. And I think anybody will be uh, privileged and blessed to live there. Um, the uh, walking area is that just in the? Um, you said it was a little, uh, the little park, and I'm, I'm assuming that's not part of the. Um, what we just talked about. I'm sorry, I forget the name of it. The uh, I'm going blank on the, the name. Detention. The detention. Basin. The detention. Thank you. It's yeah. not the detention. I, I think I use. I'll not use. to that. Yeah, I think I should probably. Park. I know has different connotations. Uh, it's a passive recreation. Probably the best way to say. There will. So you can see the. There will be. That's a great area for. Um, for the kids to play. People to read a book. So there, you can see that there will be a trail system. Uh, you're speaking to, I'm sorry, you're speaking to number four there? Correct. Okay. I you're, apologize. You're just yeah. seeing kind of a, an aerial of a big tree there, but there will be a, yeah, you can a, go a, back a, about a good size lot there then. Three more slides. Right there. So we have done some very loose uh, programming and design ability where we feel, you know, as we can show up there, we have nice lawns, we have a, um, some different type of activities maybe you know, one of the, the planners came up with maybe, you know, kind of interpret this used to be an orchard down and maybe some tree, um, not real trees, but, you know, sitting amenities, a little maybe some potential climbing amenities, but really a nice area just to be able to relax. Um, that area, and then, you know, sitting area, have a picnic, et cetera. There will be a trail connecting. It will be going through the streets to the detention base. And so there is a little bit of a, a walking ability throughout the community. Beautiful. Well, again, um, great presentation. Beautiful.
Thank you. I have questions too. All right. Um, first off, the am I too loud? The front housing that's facing Auburn Boulevard and Sylvan, the ones that wrap around the front mm -hmm. there, the alley load, I believe they're called. Do they have backyards? The way, um, do they have a little open courtyard in the back? Side yard? Yeah. Sorry, I have my, my, the real people who are the smart ones are behind me. Um, so it's a very small lot. There is a side courtyard with a little bit of a notch for an open space, but is do the size of the lot and the product type, no, there is not your traditional backyard feature. So for like family entertaining, hospitality, birthday parties? You have that little courtyard area. And we've built, and we're actually opening a community in Elk Grove, a little bit bigger lot, but very similar concept. And so one of the things uh, we have done, Woodside and throughout the region, we've been successful with the alley load product, but you're right, based on the size of the lot, you do not have your traditional backyard. And normally I wouldn't worry about it, but their front yard is on Auburn Boulevard, so that doesn't open a whole lot of hospitality space and socializing. We talked about the noise out there and yeah. traffic concerns. Yeah, that, that, yeah w I agree with your, your, your concerns. One of the reasons why we, we without being required, we, we decided to have that um, passive park recreation. It's about two lot sizes, give or take, to have that ability and the, you know to have some. You'll have some ability to have that on the courtyard, but you're absolutely right, it, it's a small product. And then I have a question, um, the map on the bottom there, where it shows the two exits. So I'm a mom and I'm a little bit of a catastrophizer. So I have already put those 4th of July fireworks that are illegal landing right in that front strip. And a fire truck is now blocking that exit that is southbound there, leaving only the right turn only at the top. How are we getting 94 units worth of families out in an emergency if we had to. I'm going to defer to my engineer who has worked with the fire department to discuss the appropriate two points of exit and so forth. Good question. I just I want to have someone be able to answer that for you. Good evening. Mike Robertson, Baker Williams Engineering Group. Uh, we've worked with the uh, Sacramento Fire District on these layout um, and its requirement. That's why we have the two points of access. That's why the reason why they have two is for that reason, so we can get uh, emergency vehicles in and out and people out. Other, otherwise, uh, past uh, developments, you just have only one point of access, but now you've got to have two. And there's no concern that one of those points, of, well, both of those points of access are right turn onlys without the ability to turn left, and there's no concern that both of those exits are both on Auburn Boulevard and nothing on the other Side. The fire no. department was agreeable with what we were doing. Okay. And, but also what we've done is on the northern entrance, we've, we widened it a little more than required for that reason to allow more uh, entrance and exits in case somebody was blocked up or whatever, a stalled car or something. So a little wider than what we needed. All right. Um, and then I had a question. Um, when we talk about the enhanced community benefit for policy uh, 4.5 there, um, so far, we've talked about the pedestrian gate that goes to the school. We've talked about the retention basin. We've talked about the pathways. But all of those seem to be developed for the benefit of the community that we are developing. Is there an enhanced benefit for the community that's already in existence? I'd have to defer to Allison regarding policy compliance. Okay. Um, for the existing community, um, well, it's not a gated community. It is an open community, so you could um, go there. You could use the little passive park. It's not restricted. It's not members only. It's not gated. Uh, so it is a community benefit, the whole park. You could go to the detention basin and access it from the plaza and continue the walking path, um, you know, through the development. It's, it's not blocked off. Um, we are... That's what I have so far, off the cuff. Okay. <laughs> I probably um, could come up with something more, but I think you kind of get where I'm going. It's like um, we don't allow, we didn't say we don't allow, but we really uh, restrict gated communities for that purpose. We want a community yeah. to be for everybody, and so 
um, this is not a gated community. And when we talk about the community, I do a lot with the neighborhoods, and I can look at this and go, oh, that's area two. But it's removed from area two in the fact that it's positioned between a school and a cemetery in an economic retail style development. And so they're gonna be their own little unit. They aren't gonna be part of that whole community environment. To me, it's a little bit isolating in the way that those houses are just kind of the houses and when I went through the general plan and the Auburn plan I read a lot of language that talked about the economic nodes and preserving future economic growth by not minimizing parcels so here we are with an 11 acre parcel and instead of keeping it large where there is potential for future redevelopment down the road if something is unsuccessful we've now cut off all future redevelopment by making it a hundred individual parcels is that correct yeah um true i mean in big picture it's true um but uh, an important feature of this property when we first purchased it and thought what it could become um, was that, you know, if there was commercial interest, what does that do to the existing commercial area? We have Stock Ranch that has well over, Casey could tell me the number, 6,000 square feet, I think, open. There's about 100,000 square yeah, feet. 100, yeah, 100,000 square feet still left to develop at the Stock Ranch Center. So we didn't want to detract from that because that was something that was already, you know, programmed. We already have a lot of empty, vacant commercial space along Auburn Boulevard. So we, you know, like someone comes in and builds a new commercial center, what does that do to the existing space that's already there? We have a center across the street that's pretty vacant, almost vacant except for a Goodwill. Um, so taking all that into consideration, you know, commercial probably wasn't going to pencil out um, for that, just for that purpose. And it wasn't really something the city wanted to see um, even though we are subdividing this, we are increasing home ownership, it's bringing owners into the community, um, and who will support those existing businesses? They will shop at those nearby businesses that are there and hopefully continue to you know, add new food services or something into those vacant spaces to serve the community. And then once again, going back to language, um, when we talk about things like the social and civic focal point of Sylvan Corners and providing a cultural memory. How does this project align with that? Um, well, the, that is kind of done with the plaza. It's our node to the city's history. Um, those cylinders are there, um, go back to the Highway 40 beginnings and so they are, and, and then the service clubs have their emblems there and so forth. So that's kind of the community and the civic pride and this development is attaching to that and really opening that space for those residents to use and the community to more actively use that space that would connect to the community. So maybe this particular development isn't doing that, but it is not turning its back on what's there and inviting people in. Okay, and even though it's meeting some goals, if um, it's going against others, should we still proceed with the project? Specifically, I'm looking at like goal eight, the economic strength of the retail centers at the major intersections. Um, goal one, keeping the large parcels for redevelopment, things of that nature. Um, well, that's something that um, you can decide and, you know, vote, vote or, you know, your decision. Uh, but we are keeping, my thoughts are we are keeping those commercial centers, you know, vibrant by not introducing additional commercial centers. 11 acres is pretty small mm -hmm. um, for a commercial center. Um, but so we're not pulling away from the ones that we already have in place that are already built, uh, that are already trying to serve our community. Uh, we're, act we're introducing new patrons for them to make them more vibrant. Uh, so that's, I do not believe, in my opinion, that it is against goal eight, but that's something I'll let you decide. And I would just add to Allison's comments that um, no project, 100, sorry, one, no project 100% meets every single goal. They're very vague intentionally because it gives you some discretion to look at that. So okay. um, it's not 
all or nothing, it, it can be some. So that's kind of where we're at. Okay. Before I let you go, I want to make sure. Oh, do we have um, what other SPAs uh, towards residential do we have applied in uh, specific nodes throughout the city? Um, we have 13 different SPAs in various areas. Um, Trying to think, um, Greenback Woods is one, which is a very large SPA. It goes from Verner Avenue all the way over to Greenback, uh, so that's a very large node. Um, Stock Ranch is an Stock SPA. Stock Ranch is an SPA. Sunrise Tomorrow is an SPA. Mm -hmm. Geared um, towards residential. Sunrise well, Tomorrow is geared towards residential. It's got 2,200 units of residential. Thank you. All right. I think that's all I have on my chicken scratch notes here, folks. So, I did thank you. Circle back, um, Daniel brought up a couple things to mention. Um, to Marcel, your point on uh, pedestrian connection and uh, the streets will all have curb gutter sidewalk, the standard, the public streets. So you will be able to walk through the subdivision, connect to get to those public paths um, safely out around the detention basin out to Auburn Boulevard. Thanks for bringing that up. The, the, um, and I just wanted to make sure I was clear. The gateway we're talking about is off of that small little area there. Is that right? D into the school? To the, um, yeah, on the picture I have on the screen. Was there more than one access to There's just there one. one. Yeah, one. It's select, the location was selected by the school district. And it's it this little arrow on this yeah. one. It'll be a single oh, gate right there. that yeah. goes to, that's more where kind of the front of the school and not having a gate into the fields. Um, kind of also to a community benefit. The school district does want to use that as a learning opportunity for children. Okay. Um, also to your, your uh, vice chair, to your point, um, my former company I used to plan large developments with a lot of commercial. And we actually feel that having more residents and having more users for the local retail is a benefit. And so I think the local re uh, retail facilities in that area will benefit from having these residents as future patrons. I did have one last question, I'm sorry. Um, uh, as it relates to the school again, uh, can you show Allison the slide again um, where the, the property backs up to the school? Uh, it, it, from my recollection, there's an, another large field there that's adjacent to the edge of the property. Is correct, that's correct? their, uh, my understanding that's their open field that's for, that will be there in per perpetuity. Activity for field yeah. and whatnot, okay. And so um, my, my thought was uh, lighting or noise from the school having any impact on the homes or the residences that are backing up to that. But it sounds like the actual building of the school and everything that's gonna go on is, is far enough away from that that it shouldn't have any impact. Um, correct. Um, the large portion on the west side um, is their play fields. Their play fields. Um, the small notch out um, that at some point in the future, I believe Silver Middle School wants to add a gym that will be in that location. Um, that actually was a piece of this property in the beginning, but they wanted to retain that corner, so that's why there's that cut out. Um, I don't know when that is in their plan, but that's kind of their long-term vision. At some point, they might have a gym there. Okay. And, and as a home builder, we will explicitly make it quite clear to all homeowners what their neighbors are. So that, I mean, I live next to a school, and. I knew what I was getting into, so mm -hmm. um, you know it's properly disclosed, just so everyone knows. So there won't be. I didn't know there's a school there. Well, there's going to be noise, so we'll we'll properly educate our future buyers. And you're either going to love it or you're hate or it. you're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Go by the alleys in front. So you have a choice: the cemetery or the school, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ground that needs it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I have one more comment. Um, I, I think the way um, the Sylvan Corners Plaza is right now, which is passing by. I, I just don't feel like it's very usable. I can't imagine somebody just sitting down there and hanging out. But uh, the way you guys paired that with the basin there seems much more, seems to pair well together. So, Thank you. Um, yeah. We want everyone to be very proud of that corner for a long time to come. That was. Um, Thank you, um, Commissioner, for that, because that was a very important comment from the City Council, 
as they invested a lot into that corner. It's beautiful, but it really was not usable. You drive by it and look at it, so that's nice. Uh, but with these connections, that's why they did include them in their goals. It's like, how can we make best use of our investment at that corner and activate that space? Whatever the user is on the site, they wanted it to connect to the plaza. Um, so I think those pedestrian connections, you'll see more people out there. Thank you. Are, are there any other public comments? I have none. Okay. Uh, then I will close the uh, public comments. And can we have the motions on the screen? Give me one second to adjust there. Right. You know, and Chair, actually, I'll make a comment. There's, sure. there's, I think there's seven recommendations. Because these are recommendations and not separate resolutions, you could make a motion collectively that okay. want to, let's say, support the recommendations listed okay. as presented by staff or something to that effect. Yeah, so they actually go to two pages. Right. <laughs> uh, so I did number them if you need help, but um, they're all seven. So can I have a motion um, for the recommendations from staff? Yeah, I'll make a motion that uh, we adopt the resolutions um, numbered one through seven. So they're actually, none of them are resolutions. It's just a recommendation that will include me, resolutions yeah, for the city council, okay. just for clarification. And I motion that we accept the recommendations from staff, number one through seven. Is that clear? Second. A motion made by Commissioner Flowers, seconded by Commissioner Shisko. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Me. No. One opposed. Motion passes. And uh, <coughs> any determination by the Planning Commission may be appealed to the City Council by filing a written notice of appeal and the appropriate filing fees of $250 with the City Clerk not later than 10 calendar days after the date on which the determination is made. Next item. General correspondence, presentations, and reports uh, from city staff. Do we have any, Allison? None. And the next item is adjournment. All right. So at 7.27 p.m., meetings adjourned. <laughs>